Uh, hi, I'm Aaron, Aaron Buchanan, and uh, I'm a researcher at Ethereum. Um, now, I'm going to start just by quickly asking, how many of you here have heard of Ethereum? Okay, just a couple. So, and do you have an idea of what Ethereum is? Yes. Cool. <laughs> but, so the reason why I asked that is because... Um, we're not even sure what Ethereum is. <laughs> <laughs> and it has many different uh, descriptions and many different ways of, of looking at this. But today, I want to present uh, Ethereum as uh, a world computer. So, you know, back in the day, even before the 80s, um, there was, you know, this notion of uh, computers, mainframes, they're going to serve the world. How many do we need? You know, there's that famous um, phrase attributed to the head of IBM, there, will, there is only a, a need for five computers in the world. Uh, now, he never actually said that, but the, um, there was actually a point that in the late 40s, early 50s, in America, there was indeed only a market for five computers, and IBM sold five computers. <laughs> so, you know, that is actually true. Now, obviously, it's things. Now, with Ethereum, we're kind of taking it back, right? There is, there is a need in the world only for one computer, the world computer. So Ethereum offers this um, uh, world computer that anyone can program and everyone can trust that when it runs, it's running correctly and it's doing the thing that uh, you expect. So. I need to obviously unpick this a lot because it's all a bit crazy. But um, uh, so Ethereum uh, will make available a uh, virtual single, uh, sorry, a single virtual processor, a um, planetary scale virtual computer that anyone can write code for and upload to. Okay, so this, this uh, even though it's only got one processor, one thread, as it were, it has as much memory as uh, is required of it. And you can write a program for it, upload your program to this computer, to Ethereum, and then it's there, and everyone can see that it's there. Everyone can see what the, the code of, of your program is, and anyone can ask for it to be executed. So, in some ways, I feel like it's a, this is a bit of an extension of uh, Stephanie's idea. So, you know, it's, it's necessarily open source. So, you uh, upload your, uh, your program and it's there, ready to be executed on the world computer. Now, just because everyone can see it and, it, and anyone can, can execute it, doesn't mean that you, you know, as the author of your program, don't have control. You know, the, you could have your program that uh, it will just return zero unless it's you that initiated its execution. Okay, now that would be a bit of a waste of the world computer if you stop anyone else from using your program, but you know, you can, uh, you can do this. So, yeah, anyone can upload and it's, uh, it's sitting everywhere. Now, the, the, the really important aspect of the Ethereum world computer is that it's not um, located anywhere. Okay, so, you know, we have this notion of, oh yeah, I'm gonna upload to GitHub servers, I'm gonna upload to Google servers, I'm going to upload to my Amazon instance. No, so this Ethereum world computer exists everywhere and nowhere. So it actually uses the internet as originally envisioned, you know, that decentralized, distributed idea, right? So the, the internet itself becomes the world computer. And you, everyone can connect to it. Now I've, I've put a uh, IBM 360 mainframe here with its tape drive to just uh, emphasize the fact that because it's a world computer running on the internet itself, it's not gonna be very fast. It only has one thread. 
it only has one processor that everyone in the whole world will be trying to use. So at least to start with, you know, the, the first version of, of this, because Ethereum will be improved and superseded in decades to come, but it will actually run quite slowly. But that's fine, you know, just need to get things going. And this world computer has uh, special built-in uh, functionality um, features, which, you know, will be really helpful, like user authentication. So, you know, at the moment, if you want to create a service on the internet, you know, you've got to decide how you're going to deal with user authentication and logins and identity, and you might, um, you know, use uh, OpenAuth or create your own system, in which case you've got to worry about the security of your servers and all of the information that's been held. And uh, So Ethereum, in order to uh, interact with it at all, you need a cryptographic identity, and Ethereum will handle that. So, you know, you will... Uh, effectively log in using your um, uh, PGP equivalent for Ethereum. You have your uh, secret key, you authenticate yourself, and uh, Ethereum handles that. So as a developer creating a program on Ethereum, you can just be reassured that uh, the um, authentication is, is handled. So if people come to your program and say, I am, X or Y, I am me, then Ethereum will just handle that. So you can, you know, don't need to worry about that at all. And Ethereum is an extension of the blockchain technology. So it's sort of making um, Bitcoin uh, do everything. So that's sort of like the technological underlying aspect of this. And obviously sort of being a successor to Bitcoin, the whole concept of um, payment um, is actually built in as well. Except um, with Ethereum, you can program any payment logic that you think is, is necessary for the service or the application or the platform that you're creating for running on the world computer. So, yeah, that's, that's meant to be an a, a origami with um, US banknote to sort of suggest that you can... Um, bend money to your will using Ethereum, if you so want, right. So, we have this amazing thing. Are we making it just for the sake of it? We have a, a solution here, but we don't actually know, you know what problems we're, we're solving. And you know, this is a, an accusation, but no, actually, I'm, I'm really quite enthusiastic, and that's why I'm here, because <laughs> I think that, no, this is necessary for society. I, you know, I, I want to try and convey my enthusiasm for how this will make the world a better place. And the root of the problem is that uh, when it comes to organizing people and doing stuff in the world, <laughs> the whole concept of uh, top-down hierarchies doesn't work. Okay? It's not scalable. Uh, the main problem is that you know, at the bottom here, um, this represents people doing things or um, uh, services, interactions, you know, use of resources, whatever. If we go with uh, the sort of obvious, you know, uh, monarchy, hierarchy, top-down structure, then we just waste half of our resources just organizing the other resources. And, you know, this, this doesn't work. Now, you know, as uh, history progresses, we drop that idea and then try it again. And, you know, uh, Stalin had a go again and Mao said, no, 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 yeah, this, this, this can work. But it, it, it fails, right? It, it doesn't work on a large scale. So we need to um, uh, advance. And that's partly where... Um, you know, the Western capitalistic uh, democracy has it. It tries to um, uh, allow entities, people, to work to a larger uh, uh, autonomous degree. You know, so in um, Soviet Russia, if you had a shop, then you were told what your shop sold. Whereas here, you know, you can open a cafe and it's completely up to you what you sell people. And this is 
fundamentally important part of dealing with organising society. But the other trouble is that if um, you have any sort of top-down or centralised way of organising um, uh, people, services, um, uh, groups, whatever, then there's a problem here with information flow. So, you know, you, you're restricting yourself to the way that information can be um, shared. So we know and we all understand that peer-to-peer, that -peer, um, not having to go through any sort of um, central bottlenecks in whatever uh, sense, whether it be um, commerce or organisation or dissemination of information, peer-to-peer -peer is um, the way that we can actually deal with an ever-expanding uh, population, an ever-expanding need for uh, information, an ever-expanding need for resource allocation. So we, we have, we sort of have this sort of um, peer-to-peer -peer structure appearing, you know, there's still embedded within it and on top of it in society at the moment, um, that centralization um, sort of structure. So companies still tend to be like this. Um, countries still tend to be um, based on, on this sort of uh, model, even though within it, autonomy allows for some degree of peer-to-peer. -peer. But what we really need is to continue this progression and, oh, never mind. So imagine uh, each of these networks connected in the same way that these networks are. So for whatever reason, that's, uh, I'm just gonna see if I can uh, make that. Uh, appear here. There we are, that'll do. Yeah, okay, there we go. Right, so, so rather than having um, a peer-to-peer -peer network within centralized uh, setup or centralized setups uh, dictating the peer-to-peer -peer structure of underlying um, organization, let's just go for the um, peer-to-peer direct communication um, at every level. So, and we, we, we see this uh, progression has already happened to a large degree. So, uh, and we use the example of the shop again, or the cafe, or you know, the establishment that serves people in the community. So, the original concept was that uh, if you wanted to uh, make swords for people or sell people um, uh, sandwiches, then you need a shop and you have to um, get some premises and uh, have stock and uh, advertise your shop and tell people about it and register with the authorities about licenses to sell whatever um, you want to sell. And there's um, bad overhead there. You've got to go to a central supplier to get all this. And uh, this is expensive. So then the internet came along and uh, services like uh, eBay and Etsy allow you to set up a shop really quickly. And now, you know, you can uh, very easily on Amazon or whatever, set up a shop and sell people um, your things in a more direct way. But you still have to rely on eBay, Etsy, um, or Amazon for that um, platform. So with Ethereum, the idea is that the platform that you use to set up your shop is itself something that um, is a, a peer-to-peer um, enterprise. So an open sourced um, uh, software or crowdfunded uh, project. And by having that extra level of um, recursion, then the advantages that we see by being able to deal with people directly can get, uh, can be applied to every level of uh, organization. Now, it's got to stop somewhere. And at the top, you know, we're saying that that should be Ethereum. And so the problem, of course, is that you say, right, well, you know, the, the, the platform of, of all platforms, you know, who runs that? And the beauty about Ethereum is that the platform itself runs it. So Ethereum isn't owned by anyone. Ethereum owns itself. 
So that's how we terminate the recursion in a, the most elegant way possible. So what I'm saying here is that um, we've got an exponential uh, growth in the need to communicate and resources of the planet as the population exponentially grows. And Ethereum is the next step in dealing with this. And I just want to quickly go through uh, an example that Robin Chase gives in her book, Peers Inc. So she's the um, inventor of Zipcar. So she sort of was one of the pioneers of this uh, sharing economy, right? You know, rather than um, uh, forcing you to hire cars for large chunks of time, you can just share cars an hour at a time. And then she went on to do Buzzcar, which is basically Airbnb for cars. You can rent out your own car to whoever you want. And she points out that in the hotel trade, we've got Intercontinental, uh, sorry, uh, Intercontinental Hotels Group, which is a 6 year old company. It's been uh, building its business you know, for decades, building new hotels, taking over other chains, whatever. And after 60 years, it's got just over half a million um, hotel rooms, right? So this is the traditional approach. We are centralized, we will build hotels, we will provide hotel rooms to people. Airbnb, after four years, has surpassed them, right? So Airbnb has allowed, has, has freed up the, the resource that is hotel rooms in a more peer-to-peer -peer way, and after four years is already uh, on the way, of, you know, ex accelerating that exponential growth. Couch, uh, Couchsaving.com is uh, even more ahead. So, you know, by freeing up uh, resources, we can actually deal with the fact that the um, exponential resource um, uh, requirement of the world can be met. So, yeah, Ethereum will be the way that um, um, uh, things work because... Anything you upload on to, to Ethereum can be forked. I mean, Ethereum itself can be forked. Uh, and then the platforms that you fork can then run platforms upon them or services upon them, which themselves can be uh, shared and improved. And we have uh, the ability to advance everything in an open source way at every level all the way to the top. So my final message is that, that you know, we keep on talking about uh, disruption. Oh yes, we're going to disrupt the um, hotel trade, we're going to disrupt the um, uh, car hire trade, we're going to disrupt the financial system, we're going to disrupt banks with new technology. But governance itself, an organisation, the way that we organise ourselves, that itself needs to be um, uh, disrupted. So. Just an example of people that are creating things for Ethereum. Um, Orga here is a um, prediction market. So, you know, um, Wikipedia is uh, a open source uh, knowledge platform. But what about uh, information about what the world's going to be like tomorrow? That too can be um, crowdsourced, open source. Um, and Orga is, is a platform that will allow you to ask what's the weather going to be like tomorrow, what's the uh, gold price going to be in a week, who's going to be the next American president, and you can get a probabilistic answer through this, uh, this system. What I think is more exciting is the company Providence, which um, is going to be using the blockchain, the Ethereum uh, platform, to open source uh, supply chains. So at the moment, it's really hard to know if you want a particular attribute in the stuff you're buying, right? I really want the, um, uh, the clothes that I'm wearing to have been made in an ethical factory. I really want that my um, fruit is uh, organic. I really want that my IKEA furniture is um, from uh, wood of sustainable forests. At the moment, these certificates that are given around are really easily forged. They're double spent all the time. Those guarantees aren't actually very strong. But by making the whole supply chain transparent, by uploading it to the world computer and having the world computer manage um, the transfer of uh, certification that wood came from a particular sustainable forest, then we can be really sure that um, 
the things that we're buying, the society we want to be in, is the society that, that we want. So some of the terms in case they chime with you. So I, I mentioned that you know Ethereum has many different descriptions. So um, I see it as a, a platform for opt-in social contracts. That's a phrase that I particularly like, but it's a platform of uh, platforms, but fundamentally it's about allowing this uh, exponential progress of organization to deal with the world of tomorrow. Thank you very much. We are.